Hello, hello. What's up, everyone? Happy Friday! It's been a day, guys. It has been it has been a couple of days. That's all I'm saying, and I'm very much looking forward to happy hour today to spend some time with all of you guys. Can we just can we just talk about for a minute? I know. So so right now I'm simulcasting on Actively Unwoke. I'm also on um, Odyssey. I'm on Rockfin, just so everyone knows the different places that they can uh, watch the stream. We're going to be simulcasting happy hours on Fridays on Actively Unwoke and my main channel for a good little bit. Oh, I thought I was. Hang on. Maybe I'm not actually simulcasting on. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Rockfin is being upset about something. I'm not quite sure what. Okay, I'm trying to work Rockfin out right this second. But, um, but, okay, there we go. Hey, God, hey, God, hey, God. I've got four different platforms. So we're going to be simulcasting on both um, uh, Actively Unwoke and, oh, good, we're going to have trolls today. We're going to have lights of grapers today. And they're all going to get their asses blocked. Every single one of them is going to get their asses blocked. If you want to come into my stream and spew and, and spew stuff that's going to spin up an actual white power movement, you're going to get blocked. So please reveal yourself. Please do it. Please do it. Please do it. Please. Please. Oh, my God. Look at all these people. I'm like, oh, oh. It feels so good every time I hit that block button. Oh, oh, it's so good. It's so good. It's so good. All right. So we are here for happy hour. Now, as you can see, we're going to have some trolls in the chat today. I'm going to do my very best to monitor the trolls in the chat to block their racist asses as soon as they make themselves known. But um, for those who haven't been to happy hour before... <laughs> This is going to be a fun one today, guys. For those of you who have not been to happy hour before, what we do on happy hour is we watch a training based on critical race theory, and I drink, and I do commentary on it, and of course we have a good old time in the chat. This is meant to blow off steam. We all hate critical race theory. I especially hate it when people call it anti-white because it's not and um and so we're going to talk about that today quite a bit now before we get into it like i said we are simulcasting on my main channel we're also simulcasting on actively unwoke if you haven't joined actively unwoke yet it's youtube.com slash actively unwoke this stream will eventually be migrating over there because i'm starting to separate some stuff out but we're going to do it on my main channel too for right now i just want to make sure we have the content there as well. And what we do on Happy Hour Fridays is we watch a diversity training based on critical race theory and we talk about it and we learn how to uh, manage and work through the different components of it. And, um, you know, we'll talk about why I, you know, let me just say this right off the bat because obviously I have some people that are trolling this. There are a lot of people, guys. We, we need to, you know, listen, and I put this on myself. We need to start behaving responsibly in terms of how we're fighting this because. Let me tell you what, and let's just get serious for a second. Happy hour usually isn't serious. It's usually not. In the last 24 hours, I have seen so many actual racists in my feed, in my comments on my videos, in my Twitter. Uh, it's a, Okay, we're just going to keep blocking people. Anyone? Okay, just I'm going to warn you guys up front. Anyone who says that critical race theory is anti-white, you're going to get blocked. You're going to get blocked. You're going to get blocked immediately. There's not going to be a there's not going to be a choice. There's not going to be a discussion. You're going to get blocked. So I'm just going to block people right now. People calling me fat. You call me fat. You're going to get blocked, too, just for fun. Um, the reason that we we don't want to do this is not that there are not components targeting white people in critical race theory. Aren't these grapers nice? You guys can see, maybe I should just let the trolls go, but I don't want to because the thing of it is, is like, I actually want to be able to have a conversation with you guys. Critical race theory is racist against everyone. It's racist against everyone. And the minute that we start saying critical race theory is anti-white, well, guess what? We're ignoring some of the more insidious parts of critical race theory. And in addition to that, oh, good. You don't have to block me now. I'm unsubscribing. I don't believe you were unsubscribed in the first place. So we'll just block you anyway. Um, the reason that we don't want to do that is because I'll tell you what. I have had people in the last 24 hours overtly, overtly, not 
not covertly, overtly advocating for a white power movement. And this is something that I have been afraid of for a while. I've always been afraid that if the pendulum swings too far in one direction, it's going to swing back in the other. And now I have spent the last 24 hours plus seeing it. And we're going to see it in the chat today. They're all going to come into the chat. They're going to do the same thing. If you if you want to see this overtly, go and look in the comments on the video that I did yesterday and you will see it. There are people actually talking about a white power movement. I watched people on Twitter get recruited by actual racists. People in my Twitter feed were getting recruited by at, like I'm not this is not like, you know, this is not SGW kind of racist. This is actual racism. This is something that I've always been afraid of. And um and I I we're starting to see it manifest before our very eyes. And I'm not playing this game. I am not. I will not play this game. Critical race theory is racist against everyone. It is racist against white people. It is racist against black people. It is racist against Asian people. It is racist against Latino people. It is racist against everyone. And I'll, I'll keep blocking people all day long, guys. I don't really care. Um, but we, like the minute that we come out and we say this is a this is an anti-white movement is the minute we are going to spin up a legitimate white power movement. And I'm not playing this game. I'm not. And I know some of you because I, I recognize the normal names that are showing up and I, I know exactly who I need to block in the meantime. Um, we're going to see how this goes today. If the trolls take over the chat, they take over the chat. Um, and it is what it is. And I will ask you guys to kind of clear, please bear with me because this is what I've been dealing with for the past 24 hours. This is what it is. So that is what it is. All right. So let's dig into it because I don't want this to all be about sadness because happy hour is a fun time. It's a fun time. It's a time when we actually get to learn what's going on. It's a time where we actually get to see for ourselves what's going on. All right, I have a first super chat. Thank you, Elizabeth. Happy hour time. Just finished watching Gothic's new vid. Now I'm going to fry some chicken for a pool party later and watch my Carlin. Let's get it. Thank you for that, Elizabeth. The training that we're going to watch today is actually specific to what's been going on. Oh, God. This is going to be, guys, this is going to be an absolute nightmare for me today, just so you know. Um, look at this. This is what it's going to be all fucking day. That's all right. Do you guys understand why I block? Like, I, like, I just want to say to the chat for anyone who questions why I block people. Are you trying to understand? Are you starting to understand why I block people? Are you starting to understand why I cannot? Th we only have 200 people in the chat right now. I have 85,000 people on Twitter. We have a couple hundred people in the chat and they've taken over. And yeah, oh, yeah, that's nice. And this is what it's going to be, I suppose, for the day. So I want to ask everyone that's here legitimately for happy hour to have some patience because this is what we're going to be dealing with today. I will not be responding to the trolls once the video starts because I just don't think that that's productive. Um, yeah, Jess asked, can I have someone moderate? You know, honestly, normally I don't need someone to moderate. Um, so this is not this is not something I'm used to, but I'm gonna. We're gonna try to do our best. Um, if I accidentally block you for any reason, please just send me an email. Just send me an email. I'll take care of it. But if I, I like, I very well could accidentally block someone today. I apologize if I block you in error at the very beginning. But you know, sometimes the chat goes pretty fast, and we got to do what we got to do. All right. So, yeah, Patrice says the blocking is needed. Um, no, Paxton, you're gonna get blocked, dude. You're going to get blocked. You're going to get blocked. You're going to get blocked. Oh my God. It feels so good. It feels so good. Guys, please mount that like button while you're here. Mount that like button for me to counteract all of the little trolls that we have in chat that are overt racist. They're going to show up today. And this is the problem. This is the problem, right? This is the problem when you create a movement that is built entirely around race. You are inevitably going to create a backlash to that movement on the other side. And this is what we're seeing right now. All right. So let me get into it and let me start the video for today. And then I will go back to blocking all you little racist fuckers. You guys are going to get YouTube on my side again. YouTube has been quarantining my channel for a while now. You guys are single-handedly 
going to get YouTube back on my side again. They're going to see that I'm blocking all you little racist fuckers. And, you know, it'll work out well in my favor. So if you would like to support my work, the very best way that you can do it is by heading over to my locals community, where unlike YouTube, there are zero trolls in my locals community. Zero, zero, zero trolls. And so the best place to do it is by joining my locals. Locals is awesome. We do Zoom calls twice a week. We're doing a debate club tomorrow. We're doing a book club. We're reading Andy Knows book right now. We're about for all you crafters and knitters. We're about to start a stitch and bitch, a monthly stitch and bitch where we get together. And that's going to be awesome. Jaya has said, this has been the most annoying thing that I have seen. You would think people would listen to the main person who has drawn the public's eye to critical race theory. Well, they are listening. They're just absolute racists because this is what they want. I mean, and this is what, listen, this is what the left wanted. This is always what the left wanted right here. The left has always wanted to spin up a white power movement. Congratulations, leftists. You have successfully spun up a white power movement. And because the right is so fucking stupid. I'm sorry for anyone that's on the right or conservative in this chat, but because so many people on the right are so fucking stupid, what they've done is they've flan banned the flames of this little burgeoning white power movement that is now taken over my chat. Hi, Carlin. What's going on? Why are so many Carlins deleted? Because I'm getting spammed by actual Nazis. It's a fun time for happy hour today. All right. So the video that we are going to watch today is a video from Villanova. And I thought it was kind of apropos because it is a webinar titled, What is Critical Race Theory? And this was given at Villanova just a couple months ago. I'm not really sure what to expect from it, but we're going to give it a watch and we're going to do some commentary. And of course, because it's happy hour, we're going to do some drinking. So what are you guys drinking in the chat today? Please chat in what you're drinking. I am going to be returning to a favorite from last week, which is the Wachusett Blueberry. That was the one. I did I did appreciate the Allagash White uh, that I had last week because I also thought that that was kind of funny to watch an anti-racist training while I'm drinking a white beer. Oh, goodness. Goodness. All right. I'm just going to ignore the trolls until we start the video, and then I'm going to deal with that, and you guys can enjoy. Now, the other thing we want to do is if you have not found the unwoke bingo card yet it is in the description below download your unwoke bingo card and we'll try to get through as much unwoke bingo as possible i don't have mine pulled up right now i'm sorry about that but it is in the description below and we're looking for a straight line or we're looking for corners whichever one you want whichever one works best Uh oh not ready to start yet youtube and if you get a bingo, either with a straight line or for the corners, just call that out in the chat. Once we get one bingo, we're going to go for blackout bingo. And this is just for fun. It's just a fun game that we can do while we're watching this anti-racist training. All right, guys, please bear with me today. Hopefully our little trolls never make their return and I will block as many of them as humanly possible for today. But at least I hope that they all watched an ad before they started watching this video. So I'm getting their sweet, sweet ad revenue. Um, who is ready to get going? Please type Y into the chat if you're ready to start our What is Critical Race Theory lesson for today. Oh, God. Awesome. 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 All right. Let's get started. Please let me know if you cannot hear the sound in the chat. Maybe there will be sound eventually. Uh, oh, there it is. Okay. Great. Well, it's nice to see uh, many people from around uh, Villanova, around the U.S., uh, from the U.K. as well. I see we have uh, folks in the audience from all sorts of different uh, backgrounds uh, joining us today. I'm uh, Vincent Lloyd. I direct the Africana Studies program here at Villanova University. Uh, I also teach in the Theology and Religious Studies program. And we're uh, very excited to be uh, offering uh, this event. Uh, on a topic that's uh, much in the news uh, of recent days of interest uh, in politics, in the academy, in law, uh, and uh, as we're thinking about uh, the resources that uh, critical race theory might have for uh, thinking about questions of race, thinking of questions of, of justice. 
um, uh, and why it's uh, prompted uh, such uh, lively uh, conversations of late. Uh, and uh, we're pleased to have uh, three distinguished colleagues with us. I will uh, just introduce our moderator. Uh, but before that, I should say, if you're interested in uh, learning more about uh, the activities of Africana Studies at Villanova, you can always follow us on Africana social media Studies. at Nova Africana. If you'd like to be added to our emailing list, you can also email me, vincent.lloyd at villanova.edu, and I'll put that in the chat uh, as well. Uh, so today we have with us uh, as our moderator and facilitator, uh, Professor Ebony Coletu. Uh, uh, Dr. Coletu is Assistant Professor of African American Studies, English, African uh, Studies. Yep, that's it. Um, and African Studies at Penn State University. Her book project, Forms of Submission, Writing for Aid and Opportunity in America, explores the role of biographic details in the distribution of resources, connecting contemporary debates about applications, identity, and value to writing practices rooted in slavery. Yeah, so I want to just address something um, as we're kind of working our way through the trolls in the chat. If you look like a white supremacist, it's not a good look for people being against CRT. This will take the argument that people normally reject it. This is exactly right. This is exactly right. All of these little trolls that we're seeing in the chat right now that I'm sure are going to deflect from this entire thing, they are specifically going, they are going to kill the anti-CRT movement. They are going to do nothing but to facilitate the anti-CRT movement. Because here's the thing. We need people from the left to wake up. We need, because there are a lot of people on the left who do not agree with critical race theory. There was just a poll that came out from YouGov yesterday that shows clearly that the vast majority of people do not agree with critical race theory and would be perfectly fine with fighting it. But you know what they're not going to be fine doing? Joining a legitimate white power movement. They're not going to be fine with that. They're not going to be fine standing up for something that it, like, is like saying something is anti-white. They're not going to do that. That's not going to work. And if you take this strategy, you might as well kiss any hope of defeating critical race theory goodbye. And that's exactly what these people want. All these little trolls in the chat right now, what they want is a white power movement. They want this. They're trying to facilitate this. They're fanning the flames of this. If we want to actually defeat critical race theory, then we need to be better than all of these people. What's with the dislikes? We have a lot of trolls in chat today. And the only way to counter those dislikes is to smash that like button. So I, I, I need your help here today, guys. I really do. I really do. Because I have been attacked and mobbed by these people for the last 24 plus hours. And... um. It's, you know what, to be honest for a second, it's really disheartening. It's really disheartening. And I have been one of the people that has been most effective at fighting back against critical race theory for the last two years. I've actually made headway. I actually got done legislation and I was going to do more legislation in the next legislative session. I have done a lot to do this. And all of these little fuckers have made me just want to just absolutely quit in the last day because it truly feels like there's no point. It feels like there's no point. I'm not going to facilitate an actual white power movement. I am not going to support that. And I don't think anyone else should either. Critical race theory is racist against everyone. They're racist against everyone. And every type of racism is bad. And the minute that you say that one type of racism is acceptable and all other types of racism, like it, 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 it makes absolutely no sense. You are feeding exactly into the left's hands when you do this, which is what all these little trolls want. So let's keep going. Avery, before coming and I can block State, some more of these little the fuckers. Department at the American University in Cairo and she has published on race and revolution in Egypt and diasporic return to Africa. With that, I'll turn it over to Ebony. Thanks so much, Vincent. It's such a pleasure to be here and to be in conversation. So um, I just want to reiterate, if anybody who came late wants to go ahead and mute themselves, that will uh, mean that you can choose when to enter the conversation uh, a little bit later during the Q&A. And with that said, um, there is a chat, I think. Um, Vincent, we don't have a separate Q&A, right? 
Okay, good. So when you have a question, feel free to drop it in the chat. And when we open it up, I'll be able to scan and pull your questions. And I'll also introduce some questions too. So the structure I think for today is that um, our two speakers will talk for about 10 to 15 minutes and then we will open it up. I'll kick off the questions and then you can jump in as well. Um, I'll go ahead and give a short introduction to each of them. Um, Glenn Bracey is going to kick us off. Um, so I'll start with his biography. So um, Glenn is an assistant professor of sociology at Villanova, um, where his scholarship focuses on race, social movements, and religion. He has won multiple awards for teaching and scholarship, including the 2016 Oliver Cromwell Cox Award from the American Sociological Association. That's from the section on racial and ethnic minorities um, for his article toward a critical race theory of state, which is an incredible article. If you haven't read it, definitely this is an opportunity to download. So he is a uh, published in leading sociology journals and he's an emerging expert on sports and social movements. Currently, Bracey is co-principal investigator with Michael Emerson on race, the race, religion and justice project. Um, our second speaker, Casey Park, is an associate professor of law at Georgetown University, and her scholarship examines the history of colonization and slavery and the creation of the American property system. She received a law degree from Harvard and her PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. <laughs> and agree. before coming to Georgetown, she was the Critical Race Studies Fellow at the UCLA School of Law and an Equal Justice Works Fellow and Staff Attorney in El Paso, where she investigated predatory mortgage and lending schemes. And her articles have appeared in publications, including the University of Chicago Law Review, Harvard Law Review. Guys, I can't turn up the volume anymore on YouTube, but what I can do is turn down my volume a little bit so you can turn up your volume. Review the history of the present, law and social inquiry, as well as a notable op-ed in New York Times that I hope we can revisit today, given its uh, very recent renewed relevance. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to Glenn, uh, if you want to kick us off, and then we can transition to Casey whenever you're ready to jump in. Thank you. Well, well, thank you for the. I mean, I'm def I'm I'm pushing back against the idea of a white power movement, which is at the end of the day, I don't know if that's low enough. Uh, I'm I mean, that's what they want. Again, these these people in the chat, they're tr they're trying to start an actual white power movement. The people on the left are starting to white start an actual white power movement. The people on the right are trying to start an actual white power movement. And at this point, it's kind of like, if both sides want a white power movement, then it's kind of like I don't, I I really just don't know what else can be done about this. And it's 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 this incredibly infuriating to me that the right is fanning the flames of this. Um, I have never been. I never saw racism on the right up until a couple of weeks ago when it really started showing up very overtly to me. Um, and so here we are. Introduction. Thank you, uh, Vincent, for the uh, <clears throat> invitation. And thank you for everybody. Thank you to everybody who has decided to join us today. I greatly appreciate it. I'm looking forward to the conversation and hearing what everybody has to say. I want to start by answering the question directly, what is critical race theory? And uh, because not everybody knows and there's a lot of debate about what it is. So I'll say critical race theory is a uh, movement that started from leftist in law schools in the late 20th century, let's call it the, the late 1970s, uh, early 1980s and has grown Okay, started in law schools in the early 1970s. Adrian, thank you for the super chat. Don't give up, Carlin. You're awesome. You're right. CRT teaches racist things about most races. The way to fight back is the humanist approach, not using race like they all do. That's exactly right. Our goal is a colorblind society. That's what our goal is. Our goal is not a white power society. That is the most asinine thing I've ever heard in my life. I don't want to treat people differently based on their race. I don't want that at all. I don't think most of the people who are regulars here do want that. Our goal is to always treat people as individuals. And this idea of, you know, getting all spun up and try, you know what, you know what the thing is? I have, I was not aware of the sheer volume of people who actually believe that there is going to be an anti-white Holocaust at 
any moment. I'm sure it just got demonetized for saying that word, but that's that's the truth. I have seen probably thousands of people in the last day or so seriously, seriously believing that there is going to be an anti-white Holocaust in any moment. And what's happening is they're seeing stuff like the Coke be less white slide. Okay, I, I, I'll i take responsibility for that. But they're seeing the most advert examples of some of the racist stuff that this, this ideology says. And they're taking that to believe that everything is like that and that everything has that perspective. What they're not seeing is that critical race theory just as racist against black people as it is against white people. It is just as racist against Asian people as it is against white people. It is just as racist against Latino people, Native American people, as it is against white people. It's racist against everyone. And these imbeciles are genuinely fanning the fr- the flames to to spin up an actual white power movement based on this. And it's absolutely maddening. It really is. They, they are destroying the good work of so many people. They are destroying the work that I've put into this. They're destroying the work that James Lindsay and Chris Rufo is putting into this. They're destroying the work that every whistleblower like Jody Shaw or Aaron Kinesvatter have put into this. They're destroying the sacrifices that people have made to actually fight this by being absolute fucking idiots. And it really pisses me off. And I am not yelling at you if this doesn't apply to you. But so many people have put so much on the line in order to actually fight back against this in an effective way. And these idiots are going to destroy all of it. And you know what's going to happen is the media is going to catch on to this. They already partially have. And what they're going to do is they're going to say, these people define the anti-CRT crowd. This is what they all look like is these overt goddamn racists on the internet. And then it's going to come back and bite all of us. Because of these children who want to start a goddamn race war. Since then, to reach into lots of academic uh, areas, it's fundamentally a critique of how race shapes and is shaped by the law. How race shapes the law in terms of uh, legal jurisprudence, uh, legislation, uh, law school pedagogy, and enforcement of the law. It's a it's a look at how law racializes every aspect of our lives from constructing racial categories themselves and defining what each racial category means, what rights and privileges attach to it. Um, motivating It motivates racialized performances at work. It limits our practicable rights in terms of reproduction and immigration and education uh, and, and activism, which is a very big deal today. We've seen, obviously, from January 6th, the way that uh, different activism is treated differently depending on who the racialized actors are. And critical race theory has six basic tenets. One is that race is socially constructed. Uh, race is not natural, it's not biological, it is a social construct. This is the dumbest argument ever that race is socially constructed. If race is socially constructed, then what is melanin? I mean, is melanin even a real thing if race is socially constructed? This is one of their arguments that I really just don't understand. Because if race is not a real thing, then how is melanin a real thing? Construction, uh, but it is real. It, it is not real objectively, but it is real in its social effects because people uh, put weight on it. So... Barry says, you shouldn't claim that people calling CRT anti-white want a white power movement. You do want a white power movement. I'm sorry. You do want a white power movement. I have successfully fought back against critical race theory for the past two fucking years, and I have never once called it anti-white. There are many ways to fight this without calling it anti-white. You are fanning the flames of a white power movement. It is grossly irresponsible. You're seeing it in my goddamn chat today. If you want to go on my Twitter and see what's happened on Twitter in the last 24 hours, you can see it there too. You may not mean to be fanning the flames of a white power movement with this strategy, but that is exactly what you're doing. And it's already much worse than I even realized. I now have a much better sense of how bad this actually is. I have a much better sense of exactly what's going on. If you want to fan the flames of a white power movement, that's your business. Everyone has to make their own choice in life. But I'm not fucking doing it. And if you want to bring that into my feed, in my comments, I'm just going to block your ass so I don't have to see it. Go somewhere else. That is not my fucking game. And and for people saying that this is just on Twitter, it's not on Twitter. 
It's not. I speak at, at events about critical race theory in person all the time. All the time. And over the last couple of weeks, what's how ha- every single time I do one of these things, I get asked, well, isn't this an anti-white movement? This is making its way into the culture. This is not a joke. This is not something you screw around with. And I really do think, I think given a couple of years, we are going to have a resurgence of the KKK or of neo-Nazis in this country because of morons like this. Second tenet is that racism is a normal outcome of US institutions and social relations. Race is not, racism is not something that you experience when somebody uh, uses a racial slur. It's not just something that you experience when someone uses a racial slur or you encounter someone who is prejudiced. Uh, racism is the everyday operation of our American system. So the fact that I, I live in West Philadelphia, the fact that I wake up every morning in a black neighborhood is because of the history of uh, institutional racism. Intersectionality is the third tenet. It's the notion that our identities uh, put us into different social locations. Those social locations come with specific needs and perspectives and insights on the world, and that we can gain a lot about the notion of truth or the notion of uh, how our entire society operates by paying attention to the people who speak from those different locations. The fourth, of course, is uh, the black-white binaries, the notion that our society was uh, largely organized along a uh, white on top, black on bottom uh, binary, but that racism affects different racial groups differently. So Native Americans... If you are teaching black children that society is organized with whites on top and blacks on bottom, if you're teaching that to children... What do we think is going to happen? I'm going to ask the chat because most of you guys are regulars. Most of you aren't like stupid white supremacist trolls. Most of you are actually regulars. What is going to happen when we teach children that they live in a world in which whites are on top and blacks are on bottom? What do you think? Um, I talk to Jody Shaw literally once a week, so I've got to think I've got a better handle on what she thinks than you do. Sorry. Now you're getting blocked. Gayla, you disempower them. You rob them of their agency. That's exactly correct. Kids will start to doubt themselves. If you teach black children that they can never be successful in the world, no matter what they do, because whites are always, always going to be ahead of them, they're, they're, inter- yeah, they're internalizing it. Exactly. Exactly. Things are affected by race and racism differently than, say, uh, African Americans at some levels. The fifth, and I would say most uh, most controversial, is the notion that racism is permanent, that the racial poles of white on black uh, are, um, are permanent, and they're not permanent because of objective reasoning. They're not permanent because whites are superior to blacks or uh, because blacks occupy some uh, uh, distinct role at the bottom. It's because whites are fixated on blackness and anti-blackness and uh and they orient different other racial groups uh in the middle of white and black in order to to protect their own superiority in other words racism is so what he's arguing there is that whites have only ever built systems to help support other whites and um they they are doing it purposefully to keep black people down and again if we're teaching that (coughs) To black children, I have some questions about what they're going to feel, believe is their possibility of success in the world. Something that white people could decide to give up. They could change the social institutions. They could change the way. That- you know what? For this entire video today, you know what I'm going to do? Just for all my new little friends, you know what I'm going to do? I'm not going to talk about how it's racist against white people at all. Normally we do that. Normally, we talk about how the things that they're saying are racist against white people and racist against black people and racist against all other races. But today, just for all my little white supremacist friends, just for you guys, we're not going to talk about that at all. We're only going to talk about how critical race theory is racist against those minorities that you hate so, so, so much. You're fucking welcome. They, uh, they're anti-blackness, but they won't. So 
critical race theory recognizes choice, but also recognizes a bit of uh, permanence in that choice. And the last is a commitment to narrative that uh, the law normally excises uh, things that it sees as extraneous, but those extraneous things are the things that animate our racialized world. And without them, without seeing how race contextualizes everything in, in, our, in our lives, uh, we end up with fundamental injustices. So that's, um, that's my answer to what critical race theory is. I want to say we are here today in large part because uh, of how it, as, as Dr. Lloyd said, how it's been in, how critical race theory has been in the news of late. And one of the big news items, of course, was President Trump banning uh, critical race theory in government. Uh, uh -huh. We'll talk about that in a second. I just want to know for those watching on Odyssey, um, every single person who's trolling my channel right now is going to get blocked. And I know you guys watch it on a weekly basis. So welcome to the block. I hope you enjoy it. Operations and, and uh, government teaching. And I want to say for without, well, being blunt, uh, President Trump is not known as someone who would dig through the academy to find the cutting edge thought and uh, <laughs> leading theories. So we know that he got this from somewhere. And I would tell you that he got it from the church. Uh, he got it from white evangelicalism in particular has been very upset about critical race theory. To give you some examples, in 2019, the, the Southern Baptist Convention, which is the largest white evangelical denomination in the country, released a statement uh, on critical race theory and intersectionality. It details the, the Southern Baptist Convention's, quote, concerns that critical race theory has, quote, been a Adrian said that's exactly why CRT is racist against Black people, too. It keeps pushing them that they can't succeed disempowering them and making them dependent. That is exactly correct. And that's exactly what they want. Listen, like when you are telling an entire population of people that you are the one that, that, that the white race is above you and it's only through them lifting you up that you can actually succeed. Ridiculous, ridiculous notion. Oh, you weren't subscribed in the first place. Oh, you little small dick wonder right there. And methods that contradict scripture. Bloop. Uh, a second example is from 2018, uh, the statement on social justice and the gospel authored by John MacArthur, who you may or may not know, but his, uh, his podcast, Grace to You, has been promoting his sermons in over 23 countries around the world. So in evangelical circles, he's huge. And this, uh, this uh, statement has, over, has almost 16,000 uh, signatures on it. It says, quote, we deny that Christian belief, character, or conduct can be detailed by, can be Thank you. dictated, excuse me, by any authority other than, other than scripture. And we deny that, that the postmodern ideologies derived from intersectionality, radical feminism, and critical race theory are consistent with biblical teaching. I could go on with uh, evangelical attacks on critical race theory, but there are years of them. Uh, and they all boil down to a notion that critical race theory challenges uh, the notion of an objective truth, uh, that intersectionality privileges some voices over others, in particular privileges racialized minorities' voices. That's not an objection. It's not an objection. Like, so what he just said is, is one of the objections to critical race theory is it prioritizes the voices of minorities. That's not an objection at all. No one cares whose voice is prioritized. We just don't feel that you should be doing it based entirely on race. That is the entire point. And again, it is an incredibly, and again, I'm only focusing on no, racism, not against white people today. Like it is an incredibly racist idea to elevate someone just because of the color of their skin. Putting Kamala Harris in the VP slot just because she's a black woman is not only incredibly racist, it's incredibly misogynist. And if I were Kamala, I mean, like, listen, we know that Kamala Harris is, is star for power, and so she was never going to turn that down. But I would never, I would never want to be put in a position simply because I'm a woman or simply because of the color of my skin. And I don't know many people who would. It is incredibly patronizing. Over the uh, voices of whites, 
and that it is like like I say contrary to scripture uh, in the sense of of objectivity. So I think that it's important for us to. For those of you who think that I'm exaggerating when I say that these idiots are spinning up a white power movement, I want to show you something that someone just chatted in. Um, oh, we got a super chat, Dragon Water. I would like to add to your worry about a white power movement, a worry about the formation of a power movement for every identity group. Yeah, I, I, I hear you there, but that's not what I'm looking for. I'm not what I'm looking for. Hang on. I'm looking for this one. Atonal. Since intellectual debate has failed and declared ideological war is wrong, then what is the answer? Pacifism? These people are literally trying to convince you that the only solution to this problem is a race war. That's what they're trying to convince you of. That's what they're trying to spin up. And now he gets the block. Given the power, frankly, of the church uh, to move politics, given its funding, given uh, how so many people come to the academy, uh, Dan, they're not lefties. They're groipers. These are groipers. These are Nick Fuentes's little little minions. Is what this is. First, with the church as a as a large backdrop in their lives, that it's important that we, as critical race theorists, be able to speak to them on their terms. So I would say that we, as critical race theorists, should continue to be aggressive in promoting critical race theory. That we should. Uh, say how it relates to spirituality and religion in particular. So I'll do that in um, in just a couple of, of ways. What happened? Where did sound go? Did he mute himself? We lost you. Oh. Can you hear me now? Oh, there he is. Yes, he's you're back. back. Excellent. Okay, back. okay, great. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, one is to say that Evangelical Christians are very upset about critical race theory because it is self-consciously grounded in Marxism. Now, when evangelical Christians here is grounded wait, in Marxism, wait, wait, but, wait, 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 wait. Did he just say the quiet part out loud? Did he just say the quiet part out loud? Hang on a second. Hey God, hey God. In um in just a couple of, of ways. He has to come back, but then he's going to say something that I want to make sure, because I'm clipping this shit. If he actually just said that out loud, I'm absolutely we clipping this. You. Do you hear me now? Yes, you're back. Okay, I'm back. Okay, great. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, one is to say that e evangelical Christians are very upset about critical race theory because it is self-consciously grounded in Marxism. Now, when evangelical Christians hear... that <laughs> excellent is grounded in marxism what they think is religion is opiate of the masses right that religion is a distraction from justice that religion is nothing more than uh fictions that are are uh see if nothing else now if nothing else comes from this stream we at least have that one clip that we can use everywhere how great is that? That's a win. That make people deviate from reality. And of course, evangelicals hold that religion is the ultimate reality. But I want to say that the Marxist foundation of critical race theory is at base. The Marxist foundation of critical race theory. Can everyone, can everyone do a high five like Gala in the chat? Can everyone do that, please? The Marxist Foundation of Critical Race Theory? Hell oh. Celine, it's like they read Helter Skelter and thought Charles Manson was onto something. He wanted to start race wars and then rule over Blackie. Yes, this is... Celine, you just described the Groypers in like one fail swoop, girl. <laughs> it is. It's Helter Skelter. That's exactly what it is. Yes. Nero Red says that the U.S. system and everything in it is racist and CRT is from the U.S. academic system. It can only be conflicting against itself. I don't know about that, but we'll go for that for right now. A spiritual concern. If you read Marx, you know that he was concerned about alienation specifically alienation of the species being, that element of humanity uh, that provides creativity. I just want to say, Jay, I don't know if you're serious or you're a troll, um, but I better figure it out soon because you're going to get blocked if you're not serious. That is unique to the individual, uh, 
that really gives us, it, it is what defines humans from animals in that case. And that Marx was concerned that our modern systems were flattening that humanity and, and alienating. Oh yes, Marx was absolutely concerned that our modern systems were flattening humanity. I'm sure that's true. Louise Rich says, damn, Doc, laying down the bad, righteous bad hammer with gusto. Get him, Carla. Love you. Keep fighting the good fight that needs to be fought. Listen, man, I am not, I don't think that you can really, yeah. <laughs> yes, he did just say <laughs> Yeah, I have no problem with banning anyone and everyone. I banned like 600 people today on Twitter. It felt goddamn great. Nating us from the creative endeavors that that we were, uh, well, Christians okay, you're say, real then. You're we real. Okay, just don't be a to, troll. Uh, emulate and to and to practice. So the core question for critical race theory is one of releasing people, especially people of color, especially Black people, from. Uh, the oppressive systems that deny us access to our species being, including racism. It's Who's denying you access to anything? That's completely made up. What are you denied access to in this world because of the color of your skin, honestly? And like, wait, what they never do is they never answer questions about like, what specific laws do you want repealed? What specific policies do you want repealed? Dragonwater reminds us that since we have so many groipers in my chat today, we need to probe that like button. Usually we mouth the like button. Maybe we're doing a little, we're being a little bit more, uh, I don't, I don't even know what that is, but, but do, do, do whatever you want to do with the like button. Okay. Do whatever you want to do with the like button. Marxism, my point being critical race theories, Marxism is function is fundamentally a spiritual, uh, concern. And it's the same spiritual concern that evangelical Christians have and that they believe that uh, all people are made in the Imago Dei. Wait, the, is this true? The... Did Joe Bishop Henchman just resign? Hang on, breaking news. Does it, is this fucking true? Hang on, I need to. I need to see if this is real, or if you're lying to me. If you're lying to me, you're getting a ban out of lying. Oh my god, I hope he did resign. I'm gonna check my Mises chat right uh, now. Image of God. And they are endowed by their creator <laughs> with uh, special abilities, creativity, individuality that needs to be manifested Massage in the world. Massage the like button, so dry, the, no the, lube. The church <laughs> and critical race theory actually have the same uh, the same purpose when, with respect to uh, You're right. the Marxist origins, even though evangelical. You're for right. Critical race theory is one of releasing people, especially people of color, especially black people, from... He's going to make a comparison with the church and critical race theory and about like how they're alike. Uh, the oppressive systems that deny us access to our species being, including racism. It's Marxism, my point being critical race theory's Marxism is function is fundamentally a spiritual uh, concern. And it's the same spiritual concern that evangelical Christians have. And it's fundamentally a spiritual concern. Okay. And that they believe that uh, all people are made in the Imago Dei, the, the uh, image of God, and they are endowed by their creator <laughs> with uh, special abilities, creativity, individuality that needs to be manifested in the world. So the, the church and critical race theory actually have the same, uh, the same purpose. When the church? And critical race theory have the same purpose. This webinar is already fucking gold. Deborah says they remind me of two year olds who want something, but they don't know what it is that they want. I think that that's I think that's true of more than one person that we're interacting with today. When with respect to uh, the Marxist origins, even though evangelicals don't seem to recognize that. The second point that I would make is that evangelicals concern about uh, truth and concern about uh, intersectionality in particular and their concern about unity is something that comes out of... Well, I did block that fucker from No White Guilt today, so that's probably why. He's probably crying to his mommy that he got blocked on Twitter. Oh my god, I got blocked. I can't believe she blocked... I can't believe after she said she was going to block people that did this, she still blocked me after I did the same thing she told me not to do. They always go and cry. 
they always go and run off and cry every time I block them. It's it's so sad and pathetic. It's like these these trolls, like they melt down into like little whiny babies. Mimi, can't you block me? I can't believe you blocked me. I think a misreading of critical race theory and, and perhaps a misreading of uh, their own yeah. sacred text. Well, and even more like, listen, uh, you know, I mean, racism is their religion. Racism is the God of their religion. They literally worship racism. They look for racism in everything. They look for racism everywhere in everything. And so do, does the left really want to get rid of racism? No, no, of course they don't. Why would they make a ton of money from it? Uh, I'll give you an example. So intersectionality is an argument that uh, we need to, that we've historically privileged the voices of the dominant group, that we need to privilege the voices of the subordinate group no. in order to get a better and more holistic view of what the truth is. Okay, so what this is, oh, I blocked many people today, but I definitely blocked him. Yeah, absolutely. I, I absolutely blocked him. Um. But so, okay, so what they said is like, you know, critical race theory is about privileging the group that has been previously oppressed. But the, the thing of it is, is, you know, what for, for those who might be new and actually want to have this conversation, the critical race theorists essentially think that Martin Luther King didn't go far enough. So what they think is that Martin Luther King like stopped too soon at equality and what he really should have gone for is actual revenge against, you know, a revenge against the oppressors by kind of flipping the script and, and um, prioritizing people. Um, that's fundamentally offensive to me. I think that's fundamentally offensive to a lot of people. That parallels a scripture and forgive me for reading uh, from the New Testament. This is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verses 23 through 25, says that Christians are all part of one body, quote, and those members of the body, which we think to be <gasps> less honorable, on these we- Holy shit, Joe Bishop Henchman did resign. Holy shit, Joe Bishop Henchman resigned. Holy crap. Wow. Wow. I actually need to do okay, so for people who don't know, okay, this is okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring myself up for a second. So for people who haven't been following the drama in the Libertarian Party that I've been documenting on this channel, this all starts with like the I, I'm actually a member of the New Hampshire Libertarian Party. And this all started like a week ago where Joe Bishop Henchman, who is the chairman of the National Party, colluded with the chair of my party to start a hostile takeover in which I temporarily got kicked out of the Libertarian Party unless I swore a loyalty oath. And they stole all our stuff and they stole our website and our Twitter and stole all of our membership data. And basically he was getting courted in it. Like people had figured out that he was involved and he has just resigned ahead of the big meeting tonight. Holy shit, guys. The chairman of the National Libertarian Party just resigned. <laughs> oh my God, this is the best. All right, back to our training. We bestow greater honor and, on, and our unpresentable parts have greater, uh, have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. In other words, God recognized, in order to create a unified body in the church, God recognized that he was bringing together people from different social locations, and that those different social locations had different levels of honor and dishonor, and that the way to bring a Okay, I just wanted to hear what you had to say, but Dragon Water said, call me crazy, but when you privilege the previously oppressed group, you create a new oppressed group. Exactly. Exactly. I cannot believe Joe Bishop Henchman resigned. Holy about shit. About security, the, uh, to bring about unity, to bring about equality, to restore the equality that is implied by the Imago Dei, was to give more honor to those parts that society had denied uh, honor to. In other words, the marginalized voices are supposed to be privileged in the church 
which is the same argument that intersectionality and critical race theory make about voices in all of our social institutions. So again, I, I, I do not think that, you know, crit critical race theory does not start out as primarily a, uh, uh, a religious uh, endeavor. It starts out as a legal endeavor and its uh, insights are mostly in the law. But because the church has gathered itself as Okay, so they're 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 running around about how critical race theory started in the law. And this is important because this is an argument that we're going to hear a lot of when people say, you don't even know what critical race theory means. You don't even know the definition of critical race theory. And this is specifically why when I wrote the definition of critical race theory that I talked about in the video I did the other day on the channel. Um, this is why I specifically said critical race theory is an ideology that started in the 1970s. And more specifically, it started in law schools. So if, if there's like, if you're dealing with someone who's saying you don't even know what critical race theory means you can say critical race theory is an ideology that started in academia in the 1970s specifically in law schools for for the specific purpose of doing dealing with like racial inequities or something like that so that's what it is and then it morphed into a monster much like the burgeoning white power movement that our trolley friends are opposition. involved with today i think that critical race theory should be able and and are able to answer the church on its own terms and fend off this particular uh, attack through the language of critical race theory and the language of the church at the same time. And with that, I'll end my discussion. Wonderful, thank you so much. Casey, would you like to take over? Sure, yes, thank you, Glenn. Can everybody hear me, first of all? Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for that, Glenn. It was very illuminating. Um, as a lawyer and someone who teaches at a law school, I have not thought so much about the dimensions mm -hmm. of this problem having to do with the church. And so thank you. That was incredibly rich and helpful. Um, I will just go over the key questions we received also, you know, the topics that um, are on the table for today. So what is critical race theory? I mean, I think, um, Professor Bracey has done an incredibly thorough job. So I'll just add, I think, you know, as a, as a school that originated within law schools, um, the way I think about it is that it is both a very small group of academics, actually, at least within law schools. And yet it also casts an incredibly large tent. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is for better or worse, there is a much <gasps> broader popular understanding of critical is this woman the same woman that we watched like towards the beginning went like of of these happy hours that like was doing that webinar do you guys remember that webinar that we watched from new hampshire from that group that was like working against 544 i'm pretty sure that's the same woman these with these people keep showing up over and over and over again in streams race theory now um in part, she's like my new kate slater um made even broader by the attacks from the last administration, which um, had no idea what it was talking about, of course, but was also onto something, I think, in the sense that the School of Critical Race Theory, which is frankly pretty marginalized within law schools, has undergone pretty sustained attack within law schools um, for a very long time. And also I would say is by no means uniformly Marxist. Maybe we can talk about that later in the discussion. And that's maybe an interesting interdisciplinary uh, difference. Even though it is a small, rather marginalized group of academics within law schools, it has had a huge impact on the way that people think about race and institutions more broadly on race and the law, um, on other fields of scholarly inquiry, um, sociology, religious studies, among others, but also on practice. And this takes us back to the kind of locus of the law school and what we do. Um, this is evident in the kind of diversity trainings on implicit bias um, that the administration was protesting and, and outlawing, but- No, also wrong, wrong, wrong. They always want to argue that, you know, bans on critical race theory, they just want to ban diversity training. They just want to ban diversity training. That's all they really want to do. They just want to ban diversity training. No, diversity training is not even banned. You can still do diversity training. Liars, liars. And how courts and practitioners, advocates think about context and history um, and where and how these questions of race are arising in the phenomena that they see as they seek to govern. Um, so 
why does that matter today? I think I think everyone who's here this afternoon for this session is already on board with the fact that it matters. Um, race is something that everyone's got an opinion on, but there's obviously a lot to think about and learn. And I would say that's especially true that we can learn a lot from scholarship, specifically with respect to the question of institutions um, and law, the history of institutions and law. Um, race is an enormously complex issue in terms of how it works through those institutions. And it is not very well understood because that study has been marginalized for most of the existence of these institutions, <laughs> educational institutions. She's making the argument that you can't study what you want in college. Okay. Oh, there is actually someone wearing a mask on the Zoom. Holy shit. I didn't even, like, I, there, I think I might have wrongfully banned someone in the chat who was making comments about wearing a mask on the Zoom because I didn't notice that there was actually someone wearing a mask on the Zoom. And if I wrong, wrongfully banned you from my chat, again, please email me. I will Included. undo it. I promise. And consequently, there are very well established stories about governance, about Congress, elected officials fields like property contracts and so on and so forth go all the way down the line anything you can think of evidence civil procedure um, there are very well established stories about american history and law um, that everyone is familiar with that are built on a complete erasure of the issue of race and the histories of conquest and slavery which is oh I no studied. you're good you're good um so again this is not just a scholarly inquiry this does mean that the stories are wrong, um, but it's not just a matter of more accurate facts. Obviously, it's also a more accurate facts. Isn't that a little bit like saying alternative facts? I'm listening, says whatever when I never hear said is the U.S. black population remains about 12 to 13 percent. Of course, it is not the dominant culture. I mean, like, you know, to be honest with you, like, I don't. OK, this might be a little controversial. I don't understand why people are so concerned about the dominant culture. Like, like, you know, most of the time, like there is no culture of the United States. There is, I mean, you might be able to argue that there's a culture of New Hampshire or a culture of Florida or a culture of California, but most of the time, the culture that people experience are actually closer to their communities. It's, it, it's like your friends, it's your family. It's the people you see, the people you hang out with. So why are we even worrying about the dominant culture when like if you don't like the culture you're in just move to a different location i know everyone just can't pick up and move but you know or even just find new friends find new people to hang out with like life is too short to worry about this crap um i'm sorry i don't know how to pronounce your name i'm so sorry if these people were as passionate about establishing community projects yeah as winning as, as much as whining about fairness so much more good could be done love you carl and thank you so much yeah i i completely agree i completely agree with this they need to be directing their energy more positively a practical question of how we design our institutions think about our institutions practice within those institutions and also one about popular consciousness and a sense of um, what this nation is um, and that conversation is servicing all over the place and um, i sort of view it as my there's a question here about how does this have to do with your own work i view it as my um, interest and role to help bring the legal academy, which affects legal practice and legal institutions more into line, because it is just shockingly behind. It is just shockingly behind and operating on narratives um, from which the stories of people of color, of Native people, of Black people, of many immigrant groups in America have been so systematically filtered out um, that the challenge of recovering those histories is very, very high. Um, people are not asking what difference they make and they make a huge difference, I would say, to the way we understand the costs of these institutions, the dynamics. Um, oh, so much salad. So, so much salad. Um, Can we get some salad, this, um, please? In a lot of different ways. I, I would like some salad right, right now. now. Property, so I'm focused on the question of property. I've studied the history of the creation of the property system a lot. And I'm happy to get into more specifics. Yeah, Maybe this is definitely that same woman from that last webinar we did. You know how I know? Because she spent the whole time talking about her and all the things that she's done and didn't make any sense and didn't make any rational arguments. It's definitely you, her. Um, I don't want to bore you with all of the details, but um, you know, just to be concrete about it, one part of the work that I'm doing entails going back over 130 years of modern legal education and text to show 
how the understandings people have have come about basically to show people there's no good reason for <laughs> what you do. There's no good reason. There are racist reasons, you know, there are all of these correlations with, um, you know, the history of Jim Crow and conquest um, that explain why these histories were dropped, omitted, erased. You don't have a good excuse for not recognizing these things as foundational to the system. And it takes all of this labor, frankly, to pull up all of that in order to make a case to be listened to at all. And that has to do with an extreme siloing of um, disciplinary siloing that is present in law schools, but it's basically what I'm hearing elsewhere, too. where race studies is sort of marginalized in its own. Wait, wait, what? <laughs> Hang on. Why are you studying race in law school? Why do you have race studies in law school? I understand that critical race theory started as like a legal thing, but why do you have whole sections of race studies in law school? Shouldn't that be undergraduate at absolutely best? Like I get, I get it. I get, I, you know, I don't like these little, like, like the, 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 uh, you know, African-American studies and women's studies and like all these little grievance things. I don't like that in schools. I think it's a, it's a, it's a, frankly, quite useless degree. But if you're going to study something useless, you do it as an undergraduate. You don't do it in law school. I'm just saying. You know, minority school of thought that doesn't have to do with the center um, of the field of property or the center of the yes. field of contracts. Or the Patrice says, please, everyone, get to know your neighbors, build good connections. We have so much more in common than our differences. That's exactly, that's where you're going to get culture. That's where that's, where that's going to happen center of the field of constitutional law, which of course is where it belongs. So this I think is is sort of the moment that we're at. I think the insurrection at the Capitol happened just down the street here. Um, you know, in the insurrection. January. The insurrection in the Libertarian Party of June twelfth was greater than the insurrection at the Capitol on January sixth. Change my mind. The overthrow and hostile takeover of a political party was of greater concern. <laughs> Has made, and then all of the protests last summer as well, really was a sort of wake up call to a lot of institutions. Um, you know, I think we can actually thank the last administration for this, for waging such a public and explicit and loud war um, that it made institutions it's so ironic. I really can't tell you law schools have just marginalized critical race studies for so long that they were sort of all like, this is news to us. This is important. Anyone cares about this? Anyway, um, it is sort of a favor um, that I think we have to acknowledge that they did us of centering this question and saying, um, this is what we view as a threat because it is a threat. It is what has been changing society and changing people's sensibilities. The students certainly know it. The students are hungry for this, um, but there is considerable resistance within these institutions and a lot to work through, you know, um, understandably also <laughs> to be told that all of your established understandings, yes. received understandings of your. This is correct. CRT is the anti golden rule. Though, you know, I mean, to be honest, like I'm not actually like a big fan of the golden rule. I actually think. Um... I actually think, oh, good. We have more people calling me fat. Jer Jeremiah calling me fat in the chat. You, you, you should have been here like an hour ago, man. Like, so with the golden rule, I'm actually not necessarily as much of a fan of that because I don't think you should treat other people the way you want to be treated. I think you should treat other people the way they want to be treated. And, um, you know, oftentimes, you know, sometimes like if you have a person that has a completely different communication style than you, then treating them the way you want to be treated isn't actually going to do all that much. But if you learn about their communication style, learn what they like, learn what they don't, that's actually going to, and, and treat them the way they want to be treated, that's going to be much more effective. Oh, I saw another super chat. Just come in. Oh, dude, they call me fat, like, all the time. Like, anytime there's groupers involved, there's, like, this epic amount of, like, fat jokes. Groupers and leftists. Groupers and leftists are, like, exactly the same. They're exactly the same i'm listening says i agree that cultures are regionalized even so we become a blended culture even in homogeneous areas i mean listen i'm gonna be honest like i live in new hampshire we're pretty white here <laughs> your field and your knowledge and your expertise um are built on erasures is um is kind of hard to swallow so i think that's the moment we're in is trying to confront these questions and try I to love do you, it Christian. All at once, understand how it is that we got here and also try to take stock of all the things that have been left out of the analysis for so long to get a clear sense um, 
of how to move forward of what the problems actually are in the present, lest we fall back on some other received understandings that we haven't properly understood, we think are liberatory, um, but are actually parts of liberal to fascist propaganda that have arisen from previous understandings, um, not based on material um, understandings of what has actually happened in the history of this country. Um, maybe I'll leave it there because I know we're halfway through our time and I want to hear from everybody here. Does that work? Yes, sure. it does. Or, Shut the hell up. You know, I have so many questions that all my uh, task is here is just to arrange them in a way that we can have a conversation. So I'm going to invite participants, also people who are tuning in to just put your questions in the chat. Um, I will feel free to kick us off. And, and I have a couple of questions, perhaps I'll, I'll frame it generally, and then I'll ask you specifically related to your work, because I think I like what you said, Casey, about this, um, thinking of it as a kind of practice theory, um, as something that uh, critical race theory really takes. I just want to pause real quick to say hello to everyone over on Actively Unwoke. I'm so glad you're subscribed to my second channel. And you're very lucky because you have many less trolls than I'm dealing with in the chat on my regular channel. So if you hear me referencing the trolls or things that they're saying, you are in a better place. I'm glad you're on Actively Unwoke. If you if you are not yet subscribed to Actively Unwoke, you have youtube.com slash actively Unwoke. I'm going to be moving this show over there at some point in the future. But for right now, just for the time being, we're doing it on both. Place at this kind of nexus between something that you're trying to do within institutions, a kind of transformational process that's very slow and that's characterized by a lot of reversals, um, a lot of seeming gains that then get undone, right? So I think of critical race theory as a powerful explanation for a lot of these um, super, what seem like superficial gains in the rearview mirror. Um, and then you wonder what can you do differently? Um, so I want to ask both of you a question about what it is that um, critical race theory offers you in terms of a retort or um, a response to this kind of frustrating, almost cynical sense um, that it's more of the same. And I'm going to ask the question in two different ways. For Keso, I'm going to ask you because you do a lot of historical work. And I think sometimes the inclination people have um, is to hear historical work as saying, yeah, nothing's changed. We've been doing this from the beginning. Um, this is uh, an, end going, an ongoing repetition of policies. And um, I think of your self-deportation article in particular as something that says, you know, um, I'm trying to correct your false sense that this is new, right? This is in fact an old set of practices. But you're doing something else, too. You're not just leaving us feeling. Oh, Canadian Thought says, I'm sending this to you because of trolls. Why is it so hard to get into a relationship with an SJW? Because they have high devil standards. I like that one. And I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone that's normal. That kind of, I feel like we've gotten past our point of the trolls invading the chat now. They've lost stamina. They got bored or I just blocked them all. And I just want to thank everyone for sticking around. Listen, guys, if you're new to Happy Hour... I promise you it's not usually normally this eventful and there's usually like, it's usually a lot different. It's a lot more fun, but this is a unique happy hour. We're dealing with some stuff and I'm sure that, um, you know, it will be different in the future and I appreciate you hanging out with me. And we have Bullet Shepherd said, for those Christians, CRT violates the 10th, the 9th and 10th commandment bearing false witness and coveting. You're absolutely right. It does. 100%. Um, the heaviness or the weight of the unending same. You're arguing perhaps that we should have different targets for intervention that are opened up by a longer historical view and a different idea of how our institutions operate. You would so think, it's kind of like you would think, right? Like these people really think that nothing has changed since like 1865. They wanted to not admit that there's like any progress and that's just not true. I want to hear a little bit more from, from you perhaps, and I'll give you a minute as I phrase uh, Glenn's question to formulate what you wanna say, but I was thinking of that article in particular as something that says, hey, obviously people, Trump did not invent self-deportation, um, Obama did not invent self-deportation, but what does this offer us in the present nonetheless to have this kind of analysis that you're offering? 
Mm. Thank you so much for that, Ebony. Um, that's so generous. And I really appreciate that, um, that recognition that there are at the same time really um, long-standing patterns that I do aim to point out, um, as well as to show the dynamism of institutions of law and also racialization, the processes of racialization and how those two things are imbricated Who's and shape talking? one another. Um, these things change over oh, time and they change for specific reasons towards specific ends. And there is always a contest, right? So there are always people fighting. And the sort of insight I wanna offer is a little different based on what it is I'm specifically talking about. So in the self-deportation example, you know that paper was in part aimed at my experience with this woman is that she literally says nothing. And I'm sorry, I didn't know she was going to be in this webinar. We just have to suffer through it. But she says nothing every time she speaks. And it's just going to be a lot of salad. So if you want to get out your aggression, show me that salad icon in the chat. Thank you for the troll money. I greatly appreciate it. You could also do, guys, if you, if you are a member of the channel, we can also do Kate Furrowed Brow in the chat in honor of Kate Slater the last anti-racist trainer that I dispensed with. Maybe K. Sue Park is going to have to be my next, uh, my next project. We'll have to do some research on her. At this field of immigration law, which is, you know, no disparagement to them whatsoever. They are um, frontline triaging constantly, but very much focused constantly on this question of deportation, deportation and questions of entry and exit. Um, Sorry, I think someone unmuted and that was an echo. I think you have a little bit of an echo, but if you can Muting is racist. No, it's off. I've seen Okay, great. Yeah, great. Um, so so muting yourself is racist. Why are um, you to oppressing shift them? The focus into a larger, into the larger back since not everyone will have read that article. So I'll just say what I tried to do in that article was to show that along with this um sort of more spectacular use of force by government paid agents to remove people from the country. Um, there has been a parallel conversation that goes back to the beginning of settlement um, where people have contemplated the same question, how do we get rid of this unwanted group and explicitly considered alongside their physical removal by force, acknowledging that's a very expensive bureaucratic, massive endeavor, that it might be easier to pass laws that would make pe this group so uncomfortable that they would leave of their own accord. And this was true when people talked about native removal for centuries. It was talked about in the antebellum period um, with regard to the slavery problem. They were like, well, if we actually want abolition, but then we'll have this unwanted group here. So what can we do? We'll have to pass similar laws. They drew explicitly on the history of native removal in order to get ideas and also develop colonization plans for that kind of forced deportation in that time too. So when the country has thought about uh, how do we keep this nation racially homogenous and pure, they have what? considered a couple of different tactics, those two, deportation and self-deportation at every turn. Is she arguing that immigration only exists to keep the country racially pure? Did I just hear that correctly? Am I making that up? What is the timestamp on this? 32, 32 some odd. Holy shit. I just need to, I just need to rewind for a second there. I need to, I need to listen to this again. This unwanted group here. So what can we do? We'll have to pass similar laws. They drew explicitly on the history of native removal in order to get ideas and also develop colonization plans for that kind of forced deportation in that time too. So when the country has thought about how do we keep this nation racially homogenous and pure, they have considered a couple of different tactics, those two, deportation and self-deportation at every turn. And I wanted to show how this 400 year history actually shaped the- Deportation is a tactic to keep the country, what? Oh my God landscape the social landscape of the nation really to impose forms of subordination made um, by laws that are in the background that make these groups uncomfortable um, the so that and they will either leave 
It is the teenth. It is. And you know what? Here's the thing. I have no problem with making Juneteenth a holiday. I have no problem with that. I think I think that the rights backlash against Juneteenth being a holiday is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my flipping life. It's so stupid. And even, you know what? Even And I know she's saying something crazy right now and we all want to get back to it. But, like, Charlie Kirk, fucking Charlie Kirk, that goddamn grifter, he came out a year ago. He came out a year ago in favor of Juneteenth. I think the federal holidays, to, well, the federal holidays being celebrated today, Jan. Um, So Charlie Kirk came out a year ago in favor of Juneteenth. And then as soon as it happened now, he's like, nah, Republicans shouldn't have voted for it. So it's like this massive hypocrisy on the right that's just all about like calling out the side that you disagree with. It's so stupid. Republicans that didn't support Juneteenth being a holiday missed the damn boat. Like, why not? Who cares? Who really cares if we have an additional federal holiday? And P.S., slavery ending in the United States is a good thing. That's something we should be celebrating. I have absolutely no problem with a federal... What We have, like, goddamn Flag Day. Like, we have, like, all sorts of crazy federal holidays commemorating all sorts of things. Why not this? Of course we should have that as a holiday. Yeah, I agree with you that June, Juneteenth is kind of a dumb sounding name, but it is what it is. That's what it's called. There's nothing we can do about that. In Texas, it was already... A, if, if it is a holiday in Texas, like, why are we making a big deal out of this? Alexandra, thank you, Alexandra, for your constant promotion of mounting the like button because we need mounts on that like button even more today guys because the groipers bombed my chat and all disliked the video so if you haven't yet liked that like li hit that like button or mounted that like button please do me a solid and uh undo the damage the groipers have done by being little racist fuckwits I'm listening, says she hasn't read the 2020 census report. Nothing homogeneous here. I mean, listen, like, I don't think there's an issue in acknowledging when areas are more white. I just don't think there's an issue with it. But there's also factual realities. Or so that if they stay, that presence is conditional upon them accepting certain things like really low wage labor no protections by law for basic rights that citizens are entitled to, that sort of thing. And that this has a very long history. And that if we only think of this as a matter of citizenship and borders and entry and exit, we are missing the larger issues that have always been at stake in questions of government regulation of migration, um, which has always been racialized and concerned also with techniques of subordination. So that was what I wanted to say there. Um, it's different, I would say, for different subjects. So I also work on the field of property and um, I know what you mean. I never expected to be working early in the 17th century. I wasn't trained in this. I mean, I've sort of trained myself over a decade, but the reason I do that is not just to say um, these things are forever old, <laughs> you know, and permanent and with us, it's actually quite the contrary. So the reason I do that is because we take so much about this land system for granted and we think it is natural. <gasps> we might get our land blessing yet. Trade land like it's chattel. <gasps> okay, I'm gonna make executive decision, executive decision. Anyone who has a land blessing square can check off that square on your bingo card. You want to know why? Because she's talking about basically land, like, you know, colonization right now. So I am making the decision that that counts as a land blessing for the purpose of this particular training. Um, I'm listening said we've celebrated Juneteenth in Texas for a long time. Hence, Senator Corden sponsored it. Yeah, I mean, it's so stupid. I don't understand why... Republic like Republicans should be taking every single chance that they get to overtly say, like, we're not racist, to disrupt the narrative. And this is where Republicans fail every single time because they're such children a lot of times. They dig their heels in. Like, you've got an opportunity to say, we're disrupting the narrative on Juneteenth and you're not taking it. Please, that's stupid. That's just not strategic. Like, it's error. Um, now all these speculative interests, but in fact, um, for most of the world's history, that was unthinkable. And in England, where, um, you know, 
legal scholars and legal institutions claim to take their whole heritage, it was actually, there was no conception of an enclosure of land that was this liquid, this tradable, um, certainly no conception of being able to foreclose on people for non-payment of debts, just throw them out, leave them homeless. There was no conception that that was an acceptable thing to have in your whole legal system. And so the reason I go so far back is because that is when those innovations occurred. Those innovations were introduced through the process of colonization and dispossession. Um, a lot of different aspects of property law were, and they actually constitute the very basic elements of the system we have today. So one of the most popular things that you'll hear critical race theorists talk about as an example of systemic racism is, um, is this idea of redlining, which is essentially keeping Black uh, people out from renting or owning in certain neighborhoods. And yes, that was a legitimate example of systemic racism. But the thing of it is, is that most of those laws have been completely done away with. And like, it's illegal in a lot of places. So it's not a perfect solution. But you can't change people's minds a lot of time by changing laws. And this is why I, I fundamentally don't think that banning critical race theory is the end of the discussion. Anyone who thinks that because if you if you live in a state that has recently banned critical race theory, unlike New Hampshire, where the budget is absolutely going to fail, I'll do another video on that in a minute, but not in a minute, not today, but, um, but soon. Um, but if you live in one of these states where critical race theory has passed a law against it, um, don't, don't let your guard down because teachers are already saying overtly they're going to ignore the laws. Bullet Shepard says, do you think CRT is being pushed by elite academic corps to incite a race war or division in order to bolster their own power and position? Yes. Yes. And yes. Now, I don't think that they're they're uh, uh, strategically trying to to uh, push a race war specifically for the race war. I think that they're pushing a race war because it keeps us divided. It keeps us fighting each other and it destabilizes the, the uh, system, which helps them to solidify greater amounts of power and wealth and control and all of these things. So, yeah, I think that they're doing both. I do. I think that this whole thing is. Um, I think that this whole thing is basically the most nefarious actors possible coming together for a perfect storm. That's what I think it is. Also not really focused on in property law because it's oh. as detached. We have from one the more super chat. Sorry, I missed it. Your pal Republicans are dumb. Should take the opportunity to claim credit for ending slavery and demand an apology from the Democrats for their part in the slavery bill. Yes, they should. They 100% should. But then as we've seen today, like their base would go crazy. Their base would go crazy if they did this. It's so like, it's it's so stupid and ridiculous. These are all made up problems. They really are. Making their decisions based on Twitter. I am fairly certain that the head of the Libertarian Party just resigned because of Twitter. The whole thing started because of tweets. The whole thing started because people were tweeting stuff from the New Hampshire Libertarian Party Twitter account that the rest of the Libertarian Party didn't like. And now the head of the Libertarian Party has resigned over Twitter. The amount of decisions that get made day to day over Twitter is like, it's like the craziest thing in the world. Real estate market as it is from questions of race. So I'm trying to bring these both together to say the land system that makes real estate liquid, the comprehensive title registry, the system of survey, mortgage foreclosure for non-payment of debts, um, this sense of ownership even as absolute um, power to exclude anyone from this thing that is yours, all of these notions developed in specific ways through the process of colonization, some earlier, some later, and I'm tracking their development through this time in order to point out that, yeah, some of these are pretty old because they worked very well. So they were adopted by the colonies and then the United she States. She just keeps and talking. A permanent part of our land system that we take for granted. Um, but also <laughs> as these tools were refined, the ways that um, they were introduced involved a lot of innovation that also drew on the resource of racialization in order to introduce more violent tools that proved so successful that they then became tools of general use. So I'm trying to show what the dynamics are between innovation and between race in order to develop a market because that's how we got this one. So, um, so thank you for that question. I am really concerned with both 
the persistent patterns we don't see, as well as also all of the opportunities um, to challenge and to build and to counter. And part of the point, as you have already observed, but I'll Oh, Elizabeth says her fried chicken is turning out fabulous. Wish I could make you a play. Keep being a badass. Dude, I love a good fried chicken, but I like nor I normally don't like, you know, the thing of it is, is like I don't actually eat a, lo a lot of places where I trust them to make good fried chicken. But there is this one place that my husband and I sometimes get breakfast from. It's called the Bacon Barn. It's like this little hole in the wall place. And they have a waffle that they just throw like fried chicken on. And it is like the best thing that has ever happened ever. So I'm a fan and I wish you festive dining on your fried chicken. I'll just make more explicit is exactly that. If we don't see self-deportation as part of the immigration problem and we don't understand. So self-deportation, self-deportation just means people leaving the country on their own. Is that what I'm hearing? Self, like people leaving the country on their own is racist. Okay. Jenny's getting inky with it says catching up in her Christianity was space. Yo, yeah, Jenny, we're clipping that. Oh, we're clipping that girl. Yes. Do they realize Jesus preceded Marx by a thousand years? Is Villanova a Christian college? I don't know why. I mean, the, like part of the reason I chose this is it was being sponsored by Villanova and I didn't think it was going to have this like religious slant, but it is a little weird, isn't it? Like, I don't understand why they have a lawyer talking about like relations between marxism and christianity i i don't understand that at all maybe i was just dealing with the trolls when that part was explained but it is definitely a little weird it is how much the government has always enlisted private individuals to do its work for them then if we just think the problem is one of changing the law and making the state stop doing that then we miss how complicit we are mm -hmm in what's going on and also every opportunity that we have to help a neighbor, for example, which is sounds trivial, but it's not. It's literally what the entire system depends on. Um, and that is, you know, if we don't see that, then I think that is due to a misunderstanding of our institutions that comes from not studying this history. So I've talked long enough. Um, no, I mean, I really appreciate that. And I just want to underscore, again, one of the real gifts, I think, of a critical race theory approach is being able to put the focus on institutions and not just be so preoccupied with the idea of advocacy for inclusion or for certain groups of people getting certain very limited liberal rights, um, but actually saying that you can look at our institutions to find the limitations, not just the law or the policy. So I really appreciate you deepening that uh, understanding. Glenn, I wanted to just pose a question to you, which is similarly based on your work. And, and I think um, an important distinction perhaps in this moment, is, especially in the wake of January 6th, is the idea um, the racist of insurrection of January to critical 6th. race theory as a theory of state versus maybe what people would might be tempted to conflate it with, which is a, a racial state theory. Um, I th Did she just say his, theory, his, his, his interpretation of critical race theory is a theory of state? Sounds kind of Marxist to me. I think they sound so similar to most people. It seems like, yeah, basically one is a version of the other. But um, it's, it's in a lot of ways very important for you to argue um, a distinction in order to really surface or make more um, articulate the kinds of dynamics that are rendered invisible um, by converging, let's say, state interests with the interests of a particular group of unnamed people, right? Um, so I wonder if you could just say more, because there's some real benefit there, maybe in adding some texture to this conversation about what CRT offers. Wow, that's a big and complicated question. <laughs> oh, you can feel free to kind of narrow it down even to an example. And I think the reason why I offered Jan 6 is because there's this, again, kind of spectacle that we have of a certain kind of group that gets to storm the Capitol, storm the Capitol. That gets to storm the Capitol? I was interviewed by the FBI for sending tweets. How did I get to storm the Capitol? I was interviewed by the FBI for sending two tweets that were sarcastic. And I get to storm the Capitol. Okay, I didn't even storm the Capitol. I still got interviewed by the FBI. And gets to be called patriots. And that kind of conflates their interests with the state in a certain way. And you say something quite specific. You're like, the state is not an actor, it's a tool. And so I, I would love for you to kind of say what that distinction offers us, because I think it's quite a powerful one. 
I would like to confirm that I am not a lesbian. I know I look like a lesbian. I know I have a very lesbian haircut. It's actually longer. It's just pulled back right now. I'm not a lesbian. I'm married to a dude. We've been together for 10 years. Just confirming. I just like an easy haircut, okay? I don't know why this is so controversial. Well, let's let's start with the notion of the racial state, which is uh, Omiya Manat's um, uh, formulation of the state that's, I, I would argue, based in uh, pluralism and uh, a semi-autonomous view of the state <clears throat> uh, in which the state has, it, the, they claim that the state has interests of, it, of its own apart from, uh, apart from society. But then when you read closely, you realize that the state's the, the interests that it presumes are the state's interests are actually the, the interests of whites. And uh, they have- The state interests are in the interests of whites. Okay, well, we'll come back to that. But I just want to point out that uh, Serenith says, I'm a lesbian and pretty white wing. So not all lesbians are commies. You don't have to worry. I actually know a lot of concern. Honestly, like I've actually met like a lot of conservative lesbians because like, okay, like not to pat myself on the back. Lesbians fucking love me. Lesbians always want me to be a lesbian because lesbians fucking love me. And I've met a lot of conservative lesbians. I'll tell you what. We have uh, anthropomorphized, I guess, um, the the state as uh, an entity when, in fact, as I think Gooden says, you know, institutions don't have wills. Uh, they don't have interests on their own. It's people who have those wills and have those interests. And so... We have to learn to think of the state not as its own uh, as its own feature, but rather as a tool uh, that is in the hands. And in our case, because the state has been designed, and in, in many of the ways Dr. Park talked about, uh, has been designed around uh, white supremacy, has been designed around facilitating white dominance of the state has been designed around white supremacy. That's going to get clipped. I'm going to say that that's going to get clipped. That's at 41. State designed around white supremacy. All right, we got some super chats. She Stick says, I, uh, I, I'm sure I per- totally butchered that pronunciation. I don't think they will ever be able to convince these people that they're wrong. We might be better off spending time talking about secession. I don't think secession is a good idea. I don't. I really, I don't think it's a good idea. I don't think it's a productive idea. We need to learn how to get along. Lewis Rich says, thank you so much for that concise definition the other day. Now I can explain it to people who think it's racial sensitivity training and just racist CRT really is to everyone. Yeah, you're welcome. So if if you don't know what I'm talking or what Lewis here is talking about, I did a video um, just the other day where I gave you a concise definition of critical race theory. It is also pinned to the very top of my Twitter page. You don't need a Twitter account to go in, but you can go to my Twitter account. Um, It's twitter.com slash Dr. Carlin B. And um, it'll give you a concise definition of critical race theory that you can memorize, that you can bang out. Every time one of your annoying leftist relatives says, you don't even know what critical race theory means. You can say, yes, I do. Critical race theory was an, an ideology that developed in academia in the 1970s. And it says that racism exists everywhere in every institution, in every person, in every interaction. And that the job of the critical race theorist is to suss out exactly how racism occurred in every circumstance that's what it is oh i think we might have another super chat hang on wtf people are still in solidarity for misdemeanor solitary for misdemeanor charges for january 6 blm burn the church etc and where where release i mean like okay there was a certain leader maybe now former leader i'm not quite sure on that of a certain male fraternal organization that also got arrested for burning a church banner so let's not act like, you know, th- th- they're all getting off scot-free. Lesbian towel. All right. Carlin, you work for PragerU. And you said, oh, this is a troll. But, you know, hey, I'll, I'll take your $5. Um, One, I don't work for PragerU. I did a video for PragerU. I didn't get paid for that video. They don't pay people. And, um... So I don't work for them. I work for myself. You said I won't fight for pro- pro-white legislation. No. No. I'm not going to fight for pro-white legislation. No one should be fighting for pro-white legislation. If you want to fight for legislation, fight for legislation to ban certain divisive concepts that are components of critical race theory. It's going to be much more productive. But if you you start fighting for pro-white legislation, 
Deuces, man. I'm out. How do I feel about pro-Jewish legislation? Um, I think that that's generally covered under anti-discrimination law. So a lot of, I mean, you're not really going to need it most of the time because it's covered under anti-discrimination law. Um, how are we going to get along with Marxists? I mean, you, you don't have to live in the same place. You don't have to hang out with them. You don't have to be best friends. You just have to learn to coexist. That's like saying like, so in New Hampshire, we have the free state project, which is basically like all the libertarians moved to New Hampshire and it's like the free state, dude, dude, the free state project is like hated. If I've known, okay, we're getting some trolls. Carolyn is just against whites. Oh, oh my God. I'm such fucking snowflakes. Ah, oh, got to block him again. Anyway. <coughs> so in New Hampshire, we have the, um, the free state project, which is universally hated by everyone for no apparent reason. I don't know what point I was making with that, but oh yes, I do. So we just like, it doesn't mean that the free state project can't exist here. It can exist here. It does exist here, but not a lot of people like them. And you just got to get along, man. You just got to figure it out. Uh, all other racial groups. It is a tool that is not available to everybody. It is suited specifically to white interests. It is available specifically for whites to manipulate. And we saw the difference this summer. And then again, again, I want to emphasize if I wrongly bro block you when I'm going after trolls, please just send me an email and I'll take care of it. And on January 6th, where when people of color made, um, made uh demands on the state the state was unwilling to hear them and responded Fuck with violence yeah. because the state is designed to to quash basically wait, wait. people of color and and to prevent wait 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 are they arguing that the state did not respond for like the people on january 6th because they only want to quash people of color is that what he's is that what he's arguing? Hang on, I'm rewinding. Apart from uh, apart from society, but then when you read closely, you realize that the state, the the interests that it presumes are the state's interests are actually the the interests of whites, and uh, they have uh, anthropomorphized, I guess, um, the the state as uh, an entity. When in fact, as I think Gooden says, you know, institutions don't have wills. Uh, they don't have interests on their own. It's people who have those wills and have those interests. And so we have to learn to think of the state not as its own, uh, as its own feature, but rather as a tool uh, that is in the hands. And in our case, because the state has been designed in, in many of the ways Dr. Park talked about, uh, has been designed around uh, white supremacy has been designed around facilitating white dominance of uh, all other racial groups. It is a tool that is not available to everybody. It is suited specifically to white interests. It is available specifically for whites to manipulate. And we saw the difference this summer and then again on January 6th, where when people of color made uh, made uh, demands on the state, the state was unwilling to hear them and responded with violence because the state is designed to- What? To quash based- Black Lives Matter literally sieged the White House. They literally sieged the White House and there were no consequences. Don't tell me that the, the state, because it's run by white people, are just trying to keep black people down. Black Lives Matter literally sieged the fucking White House. Lesbian towel. No, I ain't doing that, dude. Ain't doing that. And now you're getting the block because you are a troll. And I don't want to deal with you anymore. Mike uh, Rinaldi says, what's my favorite book or book you'd recommend to read to get up to speed on CRT? Probably a common question, but I figured I'd ask. Keep up the great work. Well, thank you, Mike. I mean, like, um, you know, I mean, there are, there are going to be actually a lot of good books coming out. There's a book coming out called Woke Inc. 
that I think is that I've actually uh, read an advanced copy of, and that's a pretty good book. So you might want to pre-order that. I would look at Douglas Murray's Madness of Crowds. Um, I would look at uh, Coddling of the American Mind to get an idea of how this is impacting, like what, like, like what, is, what are the things that happen to kind of create this? Because I think the Coddling of the American Mind really um, gets into that. Um, you can read um, Cynical Theories, which is by James Lindsay and Helen Pluckrose. It's a it's a bear of a read, though. I'll say that it's like it is a it is a beefy read, but it is um it's very good. Um, I would look at Andy No's book about Antifa, so you can get an idea of how exactly how radicalized people can get with this ideology. Um, and I'm working on a book right now. Uh, that is going to address this topic. And what I'm doing with my book is I'm trying to really distill things down to make it very simple and very easy to understand. So that won't be coming out for a while, but I'll keep you updated on when it will. Basically, people of color and, and to prevent equality. It is not a pluralistic state that's open to the demands of everybody. On the other hand, when white people made outrageous demands on the state, uh, even uh, denying the the you know, our constitutional processes, um, the, they found that the state was open to them. That, you know, the Republican Party, which uh, was in power in the Senate, at least at the time, uh, the majority of, of the, the House members and, and the Senate uh, went along with the demands of this radical white group that was overtly white supremacist. So why were they overtly white supremacists? What evidence do you have about that? No evidence, of course. The only evidence is that they're white. That is the only, like, bone I'm going to throw all the little trolls today, is that, yes, this ideology says that if you are white, you are a white supremacist. That is not to say it is an anti-white ideology, because it is not. Um, I just want to note, because I know some people are talking about um, Andy No's book in the chat, we are actually currently reading Andy No's book in my locals, and so we're going to do a book club about it uh, in about a month. So if you want to join my locals and come to book club, I'm also trying to get Andy No to actually come and talk to us. No promises yet. I don't make the confirmed, but I am trying. So if you want to become a member of my locals, kb.locals.com, the information is down there somewhere. We are currently reading his book and we would love to have you. That positions us. What is that? What does that purchase us? So what that gets us is a first and foremost for me, it gets us out of blaming people of color for being uh, insufficiently skilled or um, or undisciplined in our attempts to address the state. Um, if you take a pluralistic view. Okay. Here. Oh, Jaya got a bingo. Yay, Jaya. Awesome. Yay. So what he just said is this, like, th like people are blaming people of color for being insufficiently disciplined to address the state. That's racist. I'm sorry. That's right. This is exactly the kind of anti-black racism that I'm talking about. There is no like lack of skill set that the that, that black people have when it comes to addressing grievances. You, uh, you take the racial state view, then the problem fundamentally is why haven't people of color done whatever they needed to do to possess, to, to use the state as a tool in their interest over and against white. You know what's happening right now is we've reached that point in the train. This always happens. The regulars on, on happy hour will tell you that this always happens universally. We have reached that point in the training where we've crescendoed. We had to get through some boring shit. And now we're getting to a point where they're actually talking about something crazy and we need to enjoy this. We need to appreciate this. We need to look for things to clip from this training in the crazy sections. And that is the wrong. So, so it leads to a, at least to a blaming of people of color that I think is unnecessary and very unhelpful. I think it also positions us to think of means of redress been a few crazy things, that yeah. are uh, to be less state focused, I should say, in our attempts to to do redress. So race. OK. Carl, on the other side, is not interested in peaceful coexistence, even as they show you every day they want us destroyed. You still hold on to the idea of peaceful coexistence. Stop flaming a race war. 
Stop it. Stop it. It is monumentally unhelpful. Stop it. This is carried out in all of our social institutions. It's carried out in all the aspects of our lives. And uh, too much, I would say, of our social movement activism, too much of our, uh, too many of our discussions around uh, how to pursue liberation are built around uh, an assumption that the state is available for our use. We have to put that aside and think of other ways uh, to pursue our interests. So I'll, I'll stop there. I muted myself. I was so excited because I'm going to come back to that point. I think when you say that um, to put the state aside, it's such an interesting argument from sociology. Um, but I also think are they really arguing that like critical race theorists are like libertarians if they have an issue with the state? I think uh, I'm going to in integrate a little bit and maybe. High no, I don't. Yeah, OK, you weren't subscribed anyway. Listen. I don't normally need a chat moderator is the thing. I only need moderators on those special days where groipers troll my chats. Usually it's fine. Hybridize, I hope Aaron, this is okay. There's a question in the chat. Um, I'm gonna merge perhaps your question, uh, Aaron, with, with a pre-existing question. Um, and this really is about um, critical race theory in a global frame. Um, because I, I think in some ways, the argument often goes um, quite uh, interestingly. It is interesting how people are mad at me for not being racist, isn't it? Or isn't it? it is interesting how people will be mad at me for saying, you really shouldn't talk about white power. That, that usually ends badly. It is interesting, isn't it? I would say so. Following Trump, right? The argument goes that critical race theory kind of pollutes the discourse and it makes us think that somehow um, this American export of a racial theory is applicable in other places where, in fact, it obscures local histories and dynamics that have nothing to do with race. Um, and so this is um, sort of a pushback argument. Um, but we also know that plenty of scholars in law and education. Bosch is not a libertarian. Et cetera, I'm sorry. Even hang on, hang on, hang on. I fundamentally reject the idea that Vosh is a libertarian. I fundamentally reject the idea that there is such a thing as a socialist libertarian. No. No. I fundamentally reject it. And I don't care who disagrees. There's no such thing as a socialist and libertarian. Really considered critical race theory an important Bosch is a global liar. conversation. So I wonder, um, taking up Aaron's question about how we understand critical race theory in a global frame, um, as it's expanded into more and more disciplines, have you seen different opportunities for conversation, for collaboration um, that have really been gained traction in ways that are meaningful? Yeah, I think he does um, too. And then the second part of that question that Aaron points out, of course, this has been recently in the news from French academics. Um, he says after a teacher was beheaded saying that these conversations, quote, needed to fight intellectual currents coming from U.S. universities that view society. Did she just say someone was beheaded? Was, I was paying attention to the chat and this insane idea that socialist libertarians are, are a real thing, which of course socialist libertarians are not a real thing. But I feel like in the in the middle of that, she just said something about someone being beheaded. <laughs> That means we need to rewind. We need to get to focus. Why was someone beheaded? Why did this happen? Race theory in a global frame. Um, because I, I think in some ways, the argument often goes um, quite uh, interestingly following Trump, right? The argument goes that critical race theory kind of pollutes the discourse and it makes us think that somehow um, this American export of a racial theory is applicable in other places where in fact it obscures local histories and dynamics that have nothing to do with race. Um, and so this is um, sort of a- Did she just say that critical race theory only applies in the United States and that anyone thinking otherwise is silly? In, in fr okay, in France, someone was beheaded, okay. Pushback argument. Um, but we also know that plenty of scholars in law and education and sociology, et cetera, in economics even have, have really considered 
critical race theory an important global conversation. So I wonder, um, taking up Aaron's question no. about how we understand critical race theory in a global frame, um, as it's expanded into more and more disciplines, have you seen different opportunities for conversation, for collaboration, um, that have really been gained traction in ways that are meaningful? Um, and then the second part of that question that Aaron points out, of course, this has been recently in the news from French academics, um, he says, after a teacher was beheaded, saying that these conversations, quote, needed to fight intellectual currents coming from US universities that view society through the lens of ethnic origin, religion, or gender. Oh, than... oh, oh, so she's saying, she's saying that some people think that critical race theory is flaming a race war. Who else has said that? Who else is? I believe that critical race theory is flaming a race war on both sides, both sides. And I don't listen. I don't think everyone intended that. I think the 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 most nefarious of the proponents of this intended that. I don't think everyone intended that, but it certainly sounds like what she's talking about to me. The French Republican ideal of equality, because they risked the fragmentation of society and created a vision of the world which converges with the, in the, uh, with the interests of Islamists. So of course, this is, you can answer in any way you would like, but of course this French kind of disposition toward racializing Islam uh, is also true in the US. And so we can think of racial formations also including religious identities uh, as well. Um, so if you wanna think maybe about CRT in a global frame and what conversations that enables, and then maybe kind of as, a, as an um, a addendum to that, maybe this French retort, uh, you have something to say to that as well. Who wants to go first? Yeah, I wasn't sure, Casey, it looked like you were reaching for the mic. I thought you were on the cusp, so I'm gonna nominate you, Casey, happy, go ahead. Yeah, I'm happy, I'm happy to say a few things about that. Um, so CRT in a global frame. Well, I think it's important to um, distinguish a few different kinds of questions we could ask about the global frame. There is um, an analog to CRT that examines questions of international law. It's called Third World Approaches to International Law, or TWAIL, um, that I think similarly tries to question these sort of um, universally framed, um, abstract. Okay, hang on, we got a super chat. <clears throat> Six Semper ty uh, Tyrannus says, socialist libertarian is an oxymoron. Socialism is about planned economics, which can only happen with centralized power, which leads to atrocities. I agree, man. I don't think socialist libertarians are a real thing, but I got to tell you, like one day I got a thorough mobbing on Twitter when I said socialist libertarians are not a real thing and they all disagreed with me. I still don't think it's a real thing. I do not believe you can be both socialist and libertarian, um, but it. But some people seem to be deluded enough to believe that it is. And I guess, you know, it's their world, man. If they want to live in a fantasy, fine. Um, explanations of international law as upholding justice and so on and so forth by kind of excavating the colonial history that underlies them and showing um, how international law itself has developed. Of course, that's different from um, the sort of more comparative project of how different countries um, are um, exploring their own pasts of colonization and enslavement, which many are. I'm not a comparativist, but I know that many, many are, you know, and so that is an ongoing endeavor that I think um, this quote, this idea that this is all coming from the U.S. is just like very infantilizing to French academics who have their own history of resistance and inquiry, and that's true everywhere, right? This kind of um, looking back to the past to better understand the present and think to the future um, and movements for justice, frankly, are happening everywhere. Um, but it also seems like it's something that governments like to do is blame it on outside sources or influence. Um, I think she always talks so of, much and never says anything. What is happening domestically in different places talks around the so world is complicated by anything. the fact that the U.S. has explicitly been exporting many of its systems. And so to the extent that there is U.S. influence, I would think it, I mean, maybe we're influencing, I think there's an ongoing conversation. I'm listening says, how do they explain the war between black tribe and black tribe in Africa, socialist giant government, libertarian, small government? I mean, I, 
I don't know. I don't think that these are real things. I mean, like so socialist libertarians for me are the very definition of people who have like they've expertly crafted their own reality. Like you can always you can craft a reality for like whatever type of world you want to live in. And socialist libertarians are people who have crafted that type of world where the influence is mutual at a scholarly level, but at an institutional level, certainly the US government has been very, very active in exporting its systems of criminal law and punishment, um, its property systems, its models of the constitution, all kinds of things around the globe. And so to that extent, I would say there is a real need to consider US influence and the ambition to create um, a market, a global market more accessible to US interests. Um, and other interests. Um, so there's many different dimensions of this global question, you know, the sort of overarching um, inter structure of international governance, different domestic countries, um, own histories and issues, but also the extent to which countries have influenced each other, um, especially the United States, which in the last centuries had such a concerted program of trying to um, get other countries to pick up its models of, of law and institutional organization. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I think, of course, really foregrounding imperialism as, as the kind of pre-existing infrastructure, you know, that you don't have to kind of invent a whole theory to supposedly kind of force connections when the connections are already quite evident to many people, perhaps most people around the world. So, um, Glenn, do you have anything to add to this? The only thing I would add is to say that critical race theory is has always been about the silences that exist in the institutions. So uh, to hear the French um, and there lots of people who would go along with uh, that perspective, um, you know, argue that this is a, a external thing. Um, that, that they have a sameness of their culture, that it's unnecessary to race it, even as they're racializing uh, Muslims, et cetera. That has always been the work We're of almost critical done. race theory to talk about how those things that are unmentioned are actually raced. Uh, and in that way, it's critical race theory is transposable to issues around the world. Great, and, and I see we have another question in the chat from Natalia. Again, um, forgive me because I'm just gonna keep merging them with uh, a ton of questions I have too. Um, but Natalia, you know, you rightfully, and I think anticipated one of my questions about some of the tools uh, or approaches that you find useful in CRT. And one of the things that came to mind, especially Glenn, as you were talking is, um, you know, about these tenets or features, but I think, can we kind of push more toward what analytic tools have been um, all right, Tony says, in your CRT video, you said being pro-white is what they want. Who is they? Why do they want that? Um, do they push for racial politics in other groups? Okay, so I'm going to answer this pretending for a second that this is a good faith question, which I'm not entirely sure it is, but Tony gave me $5. So, you know, I'll answer the question. Who is the they? Um, the, left, the left has been flan uh, fanning the flames of this for years. The left wants people to start a race war. And what they've been doing is baiting the right over and over and over again. And the left started with this idea of trying to convince everyone on the right that white supremacy was a real thing and they were all white supremacists. Well, why would they do that if they didn't want to fan the race the race card, essentially? So the left has been trying to, to, to uh, do, create this for a while. And the right is so dumb that they then gave them exactly what they wanted. So when the right comes out and says, like, they, like things like critical race theory are anti-white and we need to pass pro-white legislation, you are making, you are doing exactly what the left wants you to do because you look like goddamn racists. You look like racists. So I think people on the left want a race war. I think people on the right want a race war. And I think that both sides are extreme at this point. And I don't know that there's any, like, there's enough, I think, on each side. Dude, like, I'm talking, you only really need a couple thousand people to really start a movement in this. And there were a couple thousand people on my YouTube and in my Twitter in the last day. And my Twitter and my YouTube are, like, tiny. They're tiny in the grand scheme of things. So if I've got a couple thousand people that are acting like actual overt racists on both of those platforms, 
Do I think that there's a whole metric fuck ton more of that? Yeah, I do. I do. And I think that that's really dangerous and it's really dangerous for all of us. And this is not a game. And there are a lot of teenagers right now or people that might be a lot older than that, but are acting like teenagers are treating it like a game. And it is not. I do not want a white power movement in this country. If you do not want a white power movement in this country, then you need to start fucking acting like it. Really? Really? Because you can go look at the video that I did yesterday and see it. So enjoy your blog. Because that's what we're going to do. Uh, useful, and maybe one or two that, that you find helpful. Um, two things that, that came to mind that I want to ask about in particular is uh, about the concept of interest convergence. To what degree does that still resonate for you? And to what degree do you feel scholarship is moving beyond that model? Um, uh, you know, we have these kind of early cohorts of critical race theorists who really developed so many tremendous tools. Which of those do you still really keep coming back to? Um, and what do you think is maybe a new generation of scholarship in CRT that you find useful? I, I hear you, Casey. Mike Post says, I wish there was one detractor in these sessions. If I'm in one of these, I promise I will be that detractor. Yeah, so if you're in one of these sessions, what you need to do, you can't, you can't go aggressively at it. What you need to do is ask strategic questions about what's going on. And, and I think on um, new discourses, there is a nice little list of the, the questions that you can ask just to plant the seeds. That's all you want to do. You don't want to be aggressive. You don't want to be like me. I'm like the bull in the china shop. You want to just plant seeds. Just ask, like, you know, how is it possible that 74 million people in this country could be racist? How is it possible? I don't know. I don't really think it is. Um, I saw Sarah. So guys, side note, I am going to do a video on this because I have audio of Chris Sununu saying that libertarians don't belong in the Republican Party in New Hampshire, which is actually a big thing because there are a lot of libertarians in the Republican Party in New Hampshire. So I will be talking about Chris Sununu. I also found out there was blatant fuckery with my, with my anti-CRT amendment. I'm not happy about that. Hang on. Um, Dragonwater said, Carlin, I think that the who wants a race war is the government. I don't think so. I don't think it's the government. I don't think they're that smart, to be honest. I think it, I think it is extremists on the left that are fanning the flames of extremists on the right. And the right is just, it's going completely over their head. They're, they're using critical race theory to try to fan the flames of a race war is what I think is happening. It's, and the right is playing into it beautifully. So talking a lot in the tradition of, I think, a next another generation, which does a lot more kind of historic, deep historical cross institutional work, um, as opposed to kind of unpacking some of the um, betrayals uh, of, of certain forms of advocacy. So um, if either of you want to speak to that, I think maybe that kind of folds in Natalia's question. Do you want to go first, Glenn, or do you want me to? Uh, I'm happy to follow you, uh, Kesu, but if you want me to go first, I'll go first. Um, I'm happy to go first. So, um, you know, I don't know if I would call them subfields, um, but related, there are certainly there's certainly a lot of fields that are related to CRT that CRT has was even in its um, first articulations highly influenced by um, that are surfacing now, not only as a result of CRT, but because You're of what is kidding. happening in the world and frankly, the development of the movements from which CRT drew on in the first place. So, um, you know, there's a pretty also long tradition within law schools of thinking about social movements and, and the law that CRT um, theorists were in close conversation with them. There's a lot of overlap and that seems to be more important than ever. And there's people picking up this question of what movement law really means. Um, I'm listening says, I'm very worried about the amount of pro-white people you saw in your chats. I was hoping they were anomalies. Okay, well, let's 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 have some perspective here. And I know that we're bouncing back and forth and I'm not really doing a lot of reaction to this video because that Asian woman is just like not really saying anything. But I mean, I don't think they're the majority. I don't think they're the majority, but the thing is like, it doesn't need to be the majority. And with the amount of spinning, like, 
I like the thing that really scares me is the amount of just like average people that are totally being spun up to really believe that there is going to be an anti-white Holocaust at any time. I mean, I had no idea that this belief was at the scale that it is, but there are thousands and thousands of people who truly believe there is going to be an anti-white Holocaust at any moment. That's what scares me. Because I watched it in my Twitter yesterday. I watched actual white supremacists recruiting these people. I watched it right in front of my eyes. And it's like, I, <laughs> if this is the, the game that the right are going to play, then there's just like, I don't, I don't know what we can do about that. I really just don't. <sighs> Maybe more directly, I think this is carried by movements themselves, but also CRT theorists have always, um, I think, um, you know, thought very, you know, a lot about abolitionist frameworks in the black radical tradition. So that's another one that kind of goes outside of the legal academy, but also is represented within it through CRT. Um, and then finally, I think um, another sort of field of scholarship that is growing, but has its roots in both of the things that I, I just mentioned, um, you know, literature on social movements and abolitionist movements, which are really the same thing, um, racial capitalism, as like a new framework that is growing in academia that I also work under, which is sort of like CRT in the sense that it is um, looking to silences. We wouldn't really have a need to call it that if an analysis of capitalism hadn't so, um, you know, obstinately excluded race from their analysis for so long. And also um, there is a way that the way that um, scholars If you have any doubt about that idiot that runs that channel, No White Guilt, like, just look at the chat today, guys. Honestly. Don't try, like, do not trust people who behave like this. Do not trust people whose audiences behave like this. Because, like, you're, he might not be in her here right now, but the fact is that we have seen, we have seen exactly what his audience looks like. And his audience looks like that. And they've been all over it today and you've got to be really discerning and i know i'm probably preaching to the choir but you've got to be really discerning about who you listen to and who you consume content from you know if you don't like my content that's fine but like it like when you have toxicity at that level that's not good that's not adding value to the world that's not serving the world in any way and people have just got to be really really careful about this and all you can do is look in the chat to see why. These are the people that are controlling the conversation right now. And they're influencing people. And they're trying to convince people that there's going to be a goddamn holocaust. That's what they're doing. And it's not true. It is not true. We are a long way off from that. And a lot of things would have to fall into place for that to happen. Is it a potential future reality? Sure. But not right now. Like, and I say this as someone who consumes this content every day, it is not a reality right now. It is simply not. Maybe if 18,000 things fall into place perfectly sometime way off in the future, and we're talking decades at a minimum, maybe, but not right now. And there's still a lot that we can do to prevent that. And when you're trying to convince people that there's going to be a fucking Holocaust like now, you are, you are not doing anything productive with your life. You are only causing problems. See, look at this. Look at what they're doing. Look at what they're doing. I'm going to take a picture of this right now. I'm taking a picture of this right now. This is what they're doing. You know? And now you get the block. Scholarship on race has grown has also not excluded, but sort of marginalized questions of capitalism. No, it's so not. That it's not. Ground, I know exactly who um, these there people is are. Scholarship that represents um, that crossover from a very long time ago, and that's where we find our genealogy. But it's growing now, and I think all of these schools are in conversation with each other. So, if you're looking for related work, um, those might be good places to start. 
wonderful. And because we only have about five minutes left, I just want to invite Glenn to chime in here, and then um, maybe we can just do last words. So go ahead, Glenn. Okay. So I, I will say that I think that the tools that critical race theory has, I, I'll respond to the tools that, that critical race theory already has developed. And then one thing that I think is, is promising, but is not from critical race theory. And that is, you mentioned interest convergence theory. I think that interest convergence theory is all right, Remy. Hi, Remy. And thank you for the support you've been sending me on uh, Twitter. I do appreciate it. Carlin is spot on. Anti-white hysteria will only lead to a triggering event, mass conflict, and or all of our civil liberties being completely curtailed. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. All right. We're almost done. And then I'll do some closing thoughts. I'm not going to do call-ins today because honestly, I'm not going to deal with these trolls in the chat. Um, I'm sorry. I'll do call-ins again next week. Um, Actually, I don't know if I'm even going to be doing a stream next week, so I'm going to be a pork fest. Um, maybe we'll do it on a different day next week. But um, yeah, no call-ins for today. We're going to finish up. I'll do some closing thoughts. It's still extraordinarily useful. I think it's very useful, uh, especially for social movements analysis. Um, and I, I could talk more about that. But I would say, coming from an intersection, uh, from an interest convergence perspective, what is scary is seeing the things that Derek Bell talked about before uh, when he laid out the idea of interest of, of, inter of interest convergence, um, that there is a, a fight between powerful, large and powerful segments of the white population uh, that is functionally making our government uh, unusable, um, that there are big questions like climate change, uh, what to do about this pandemic, et cetera, that these two large white groups are not agreeing on. And traditionally, the way that they've settled those things is by uh, selling out the rights and interests of people of color. And so when I think about something like, I'll use climate change as an example. Uh, when I think about something like climate change, where I see whites at loggerheads over uh, a big social issue, what I begin to do is look for how they might find some racial interest to sell out in order to advance uh, their collective white interests. So I'll, I'll, I'll say that that's, it's still useful. I think that we need to recover intersectionality that has become uh, a, an, a concept divorced from, um, divorced from social structure too often. And uh, if we bring it back to uh, how, it's, how structure creates those intersections of identity, and the specific needs that are necessary, then we could have more purchase um, from that concept. I'll end by saying that militant ignorance is uh, something that I think we should pay more attention to, that whites' uh, um, refusal to know and fighting back against knowledge uh, is something I think that animates even this conversation, right? The, the uh, hate against uh, critical race theory is militant ignorance. It's not uh, passive ignorance. So those are social forces and, and concepts in CRT that I think are. See that right there? That's fanning the flames of a fucking race war. What he just said right there is doing exactly the same goddamn thing. And this is why I'm starting to lack faith in humanity. Let's just rewind a little bit so we can catch that. Uh, hate against uh, critical race theory is militant ignorance. It's not uh, passive ignorance. So those are social forces and militant and ignorance in CRT that I think are, are relevant. I think uh, that's a wonderful way to kind of draw us to a close. There's something that, you know, you point out even in the example of uh, climate justice, right? Um, which I think Casey would probably say is also really founded upon resource exploitation that's heavily racialized. Um, so of course, these are organic connections that have become commonplace. So if there's um, any sort of, um, if we can end on this kind of what seemed like an almost stupid memo back in September of blaming CRT for um, you, you know somehow destroying America, then we can say that there's a kind of attempt to block the ability to describe and explain the okay i just want to show you guys some stuff i want to show you guys some stuff because they're proving my point look at that look at that anyone still not believing me when i'm saying this is happening anyone still i mean these guys are doing my job for me this guy right here classical liberalism otherwise known as like enlightenment no that's not gonna that's
that's not gonna that's not gonna solve the problem. It's absolutely disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. Disgusting. The connections um, that would make people more interested in our shared uh, life on the planet. So um, thank you all so much for sharing your work, for being in conversation, and thank you to people who posed questions. I know it's not always easy in a venue like Zoom uh, to do that, so I appreciate your contributions. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. I guess we're pretty much done for today. Um, again, guys, for, for all my regulars or maybe for my newbies that are here in good faith, I am sorry at the way this stream went. You guys know this is not normally the way it goes, but um, but this is what happens when we have fucking morons on the internet flaming a race war. They're flaming a race war. And so I am thankful to you guys who stuck with me. I am thankful for you guys who made it through the stream. Um, I hope that you've seen what I see. Because this has been in my stream for the past 24 plus hours now. And um, we did get a couple gold snippets on that. And that's really exciting. And we're going to we're gonna um, play with those. Um, but this is a serious problem. And, you know, guess what, Lewis? I ain't showing that on the screen. Not showing, well, I guess maybe like that's what, you know, it is what it is. It is what it is. Oh, look at that. Isn't that nice? All right, guys. So we're going to end the stream for right now. Um, and like I said, next week, I'm actually going to be at Pork Fest, which is the big libertarian festival in New Hampshire. Um, Friday is going to be a pretty busy day. And so I don't know if I'm going to be doing a stream next week. So I apologize. Um, but I will let you guys know what the schedule is. But usually we are on every Friday at 3 p.m. I had something to do today at 3 p.m. So I moved it to 4. But usually every Friday at 3 p.m. we do our happy hour stream. And if you guys really want to piss the trolls off, do you know what you want to do? Here, I'll bring this up before we go. Not that you don't want to do that, but what you do want to do is join my locals where we have absolutely no trolls. We have no trolls. It is the best. So kb.locals.com, you can join for five bucks a month. You can join for 50 bucks a year. And all of these little fucking racists will leave us the hell alone. And we are actually launching live streaming uh, soon in locals. So that'll be fun too. All right, guys, have a great weekend. Don't let the trolls get you down. I know I won't. Um, but I appreciate everyone that's here in good faith. I appreciate everyone that's not a racist fuckwit. And um, we have to we have to stand up to these people. Because this is what's being cultivated. And it's not pretty. All right, guys. Have a great weekend. I'll see you soon.